people have improvised before? And in what kind of context do you improvise? I'm a saxophone player. So you play jazz? Jazz, yeah. Yeah, okay. I so. play Okay, well, okay, you're disqualified then. How about, uh, well, yeah, I bet you know everything I'm going to talk about today. But hopefully, all right, but hopefully uh, we'll come up with something you haven't heard before. And and you guys, what do you know? I, I used to be a sax player. I'm, you know, recovered for three years now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, mean, I, used, you know, I used to read fake books up all the time, gave in quartets when I was in high school and stuff. So we would just, you know, do solos and stuff within the framework of the piece. And are, are you playing jazz on clarinet at all? Not much, actually, these days. I'm working on the, you know, the opening to Rasmi Blue. Yeah. I'm working on that because I think that's a cool excerpt to have in my, in my repertoire. But uh, other than that, I mean, I, I don't even really qualify that as jazz, but no, not much anymore. Okay. Um, so what I'm primarily interested in, uh, how many of you practice without a music stand in front of you? Do you always have something in front of you when you practice, like etudes or exercise books, or do you just sit down and play? And what do you play? Folk songs, um, favorite songs, <laughs> usually a warm-up. Just stuff you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Uh, but most of the rest of you, when you practice, you're sitting down in front of a music stand and playing exercises and stuff that's written out. Okay, well, <laughs> um, I, if we accomplish anything today, I, I, I hope that I can encourage you to do less of that and just pick up your instrument and play. Um, I've included a, I, part of the problem with I improvisation is people say improvisation, they immediately think jazz and, and, uh, and perhaps improvisation in its more complicated forms where there's lots of uh, sophisticated harmony to improvise over and the key is changing all over the place and you've got to know lots of chord scale relationships and that's what I'm interested in. But there's all kinds of other improvising that you can get into. And uh, so we're going to experiment with some uh, various kinds of improvising today. And uh, you don't necessarily have to be interested in jazz to improvise. Uh, however, that's my main interest. So if, uh, if I keep drifting in that direction, that's why. Um, everybody, there's some fundamental things that you, that you really should have under your fingertips, because really what improvising is about is knowing everything, knowing every combination of notes and chords in the history of music and then some that have never been invented. That's, that's what we're all striving for. Most of us never get there, of course, but that's what it is. And that's a, uh, that's a pretty ominous kind of goal to set for yourself, to, to know everything, to know every chord and every scale and every every musical motif that uh, imaginable and then be able to draw on them instantly. Um, but th the fun is, is uh, I think, is, the, is trying to get there. And the way you get there is you start out really simply. Now, what I'd like to do today is get into some stuff that will give us some sort of instant gratification with regard to that. We'll try some really easy stuff where the, the harmonies aren't complicated and the note choices are really easy and, uh, and get going with that. But before we do that, there's, there's a couple of things that if you're interested in this, you need to work on. And one of them is everybody can play all the major scales in every key, right? If I say, is, is that correct? Is everybody, you've got all those under your fingertips and all the major triads, that's, that's okay too. All the minor triads, everybody's still okay? What about pentatonic scales? If I say pentatonic scales, are you okay with that? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what a pentatonic scale is? Yep. Who doesn't? Anybody not know what a pentatonic scale is? I don't, but don't worry. Well, pentatonic scale, it's a five note scale. I, I suppose that's obvious given the name. Um, and the thing that's great about uh, a pentatonic scale is that uh, they're really easy to use in the context of improvising because it's really the chord tones of a, uh, the tones of a chord with, say, one more note thrown in. Um, so 
there are no notes that sound kind of weird. And then as you add more and more notes, you have to start dealing with the, the dissonance of adding notes to that. So you should learn all the pentatonic scales. And we'll learn some, we'll learn one at least today. Uh, what about blues scales? Blue scale is like a pentaton like a minor pentatonic scale with one more note added again. And then the final one I want to get into is uh, a Dorian minor scale. Does that mean anything to anyone? Let me play a couple of chords. So, uh, in, in jazz anyway, and in a, in a lot of popular music, the scale of choice when you're playing over a minor chord is a, is a Dorian minor scale. A Dorian minor scale is built on the second degree of the related major scale. So therefore, D Dorian is, what's the, the major? Yeah, so it's all white notes going D to D, basically, right? So here's uh, the D triad is that. But in jazz, usually we play, uh, sorry, this is a D minor triad. We play the seventh, so there's a C on top. And often a ninth, they start getting sounding cooler and cooler. So the notes in the chord are this. And the notes in a Dorian minor scale are going to be. So it's E, F, G, A, C. So the chord is E, F, A, C. And if I add a G, that's a, a D minor pentatonic scale. So, when I talked about all the stuff you should practice, all the stuff you should practice is not just playing scales, but all the different ways you can play scales. So, that, that uh, pentatonic scale is... And, and you should be practicing. You know, you can come up with a, an infinite number of ways to play that. And, and one of the ways you prepare for improvising, there's, there's this idea that um, improvising is, uh, you know, you, you open yourself up and music flows through you. And, and on your very best day, it does kind of feel like that. However, uh, it doesn't happen without a lot of preparation. So um, you, have to, you have to learn scales, you have to learn patterns, and you have to learn licks. And then you have to kind of shoehorn those things into musical context. And then in doing so, you'll, you'll eventually get to the point where those things become subconscious. They're just part of your musical vocabulary. And they come out in sort of honest, musically appropriate ways. You hear improvisers talking about, you know, playing really honestly. And, um, and that everything is original. And, I, you know, there are people like Keith Jarrett. And did anybody ever listen to Keith Jarrett's solo piano concerts? You know, he, he's like the bravest guy in the world. He goes out in Carnegie Hall in front of a full house with no game plan and, and does a solo piano concert for a couple of hours. And it's recorded. Um, and he has no idea what he's going to do. I mean, that, that's amazing to be brave enough to do that. Now, for the rest of us, um, it's a little less of that, and it's probably more having a bunch of you have to have licks and scales and patterns sort of in your musical arsenal because you've got to have some place to start and you're not always inspired every time you pick up your instrument. So you have to have those tools in place. And in the beginning, that involves doing all this stuff repetitively until you get it out of your fingertips. However, uh, in the meantime, have some fun and just learn to play in D minor and don't get, don't get too freaked out about knowing everything in the world right away and just have some fun in D minor. How many people, uh, do you guys listen to any jazz? How many people own a copy of Kind of Blue, Miles Davis? Way to go. Okay, for everybody else, if you think you're interested in jazz, even if you don't know, buy that record and you'll know. If, you, if you're going to be interested in jazz, that's the greatest jazz record ever. We could get into a big debate about how silly it is to declare something the greatest everything. But the fact of the matter is, it probably is the greatest jazz album ever. It, it, uh, everybody on that record went on to 
um, accomplish unbelievable things in terms of you know their mark on on that musical form and uh, it, it's just one of those magical masterpiece kind of recordings that is really accessible if you're not into jazz it's not all weird and dissonant and yet if you are really into jazz you it still provides years and years of of stuff you didn't notice on it before it's just I can't recommend it more highly. So, um, we're going to play with a tune from that. You, you see this, uh, there's a tune in there called So What? <coughs> it's the simplest thing in the world, where it appears to be. And when you listen to the record, yeah, uh, it's quite amazing that, that uh, these guys arrived in the studio uh, to play this, uh, to record this album, and they were handed sketches of this thing. And as you can see them, it's really a... That's okay. It's, uh, it's a two-note melody and it modulates up a, a semitone. So I, I included a, a second sheet behind it there that shows you the... Uh, the most obvious scales to use with this. So the D minor chord it suggests either a D minor pentatonic or a D Dorian, and the E flat minor seven chord suggests an E flat Dorian. So, what, so what's E flat Dorian? What's the the major scale related to that? <laughs> 